This is a dramatic reading of The Ultra Conservative Fringe, a blog by the stand up physicist available at science2.0.com. I define the fringe as anyone trying to make a contribution to a field where they don't have a job or a degree in the subject at hand. I happen to be a fringe physicist because my degrees from MIT are in biology and chemical engineering, not math, not physics. My current position is with a software company that doesn't have a darn thing to do with physics in any conceivable way. Now, most fringe physicists babble physics. They use words of physics, and yet they combine them in ways that don't make any sense to someone trained in these arts. Babbling is how babies learn languages. In fact, even deaf children babble when they use sign for the first time. I had my own babbling phase back in the Christmas of 1988 when both my mother and my sister bought me Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time. I got so excited that all this stuff about antiparticles being dimensionless and interacting with particles totally made sense to me, but I was aware that just by reading these technical encyclopedias at the time did not mean that I would make sense to anybody else. So I decided to study physics part-time, in the background almost. I went and I moved back to Boston where I could take one class a semester from Harvard, MIT, or be you. The first class that I took was the history of scientific experiments. Stuff done by Galileo, Newton, Franklin, not Einstein. <laughs> he liked actually doing stuff, it's just he didn't do really anything important with his hands, other than write math. Uh, now, Galileo actually worked at a time when he didn't have any algebra. <laughs> no equal sign, no rearranging the equation. Everything had to be dimensionless. Newton had to use the sun in order to do his, equation, uh, his experiments with optics. And the sun moves all the time. <laughs> you see him rearranging the, his prisms as he went along. Uh, we actually cut a corner there and we used an incandescent lamp. But other than that, you know, we, I appreciate the kind of hassle it is to deal, deal with something that's actually moving throughout the day. Um, and Franklin, well, he did a lot of experiments with electricity and he was having this discussion with Priestley. Well, actually, time out here. <laughs> this is what's kind of so cool about the history, all right? Because for Franklin to have this discussion, he's probably in, in Philly at this time. Priestley's in London. Franklin has to get on a boat <laughs> for like three weeks this is a boat with just sails, okay? No motors, okay? And after three weeks or so, gets off at some port in England, probably another week or so, using a horse <laughs> to get to London. <sighs> then sit down. Then he has to find, you know, uh, Priestley, you know, not via some cell phone or anything like that, and uh, chat about this stuff. And talk about, you know, having this 
charge cup and then looking and seeing there was no electric field inside the cup and Priestley saying, you know, that sounds just like something Newton said about his inverse square law for gravity. So I bet this is an inverse square law for electricity. And that actually was the case. But, you know, there's just nothing like reliving, you know, in the flesh, uh, these great experiments to, to really ground yourself on, on what struggles those guys and gir girls had to go through uh, to make these important contributions. Special relativity is a briar patch for fringe physicists. And I would guess at least half of them um, you know, are toiling away to show how Einstein got it wrong. I fortunately uh, was trained by Professor Edwin F. Taylor, uh, who was writing or rewriting the book Space-Time Physics with Wheeler at the time. And we got actual drafts from Copy Cop and we were told to edit them ourselves and uh, provide feedback. And this mandated careful reading uh, and reflection and, and if we dare, uh, confrontation. I mean, the idea that, that my suggestions might be incorporated into this book uh, was really energizing and uh, really got my brain going. Um, and I still think that that might be the best book for folks learning about special relativity uh, who have a background uh, as, as far as high school algebra. Now, yes, if you have a fancier education, maybe you need a fancier book, but even then, to have your base solid, I always gravitate, I always go that direction and not for the the more oh, jargon-filled kind of thing. Now, I was working as a molecular biology lab technician, and I needed to get a signature from these physics professors uh, to take a year-long quantum mechanics course, to take a year-long relativistic quantum mechanics course. And that was probably the biggest benefit of my molecular biology job since I didn't think that research was going to really go very far. and Well, it didn't. The, the guy did not get uh, tenure. And I'm pretty sure I was like always the first person to ever go from the medical area in, in, in Boston over uh, to Cambridge uh, to, to take these kinds of uh, real serious graduate level physics classes. And I feel pretty certain that I would be just kind of a run-of-the-mill fringe physicist sort if I had not had that kind of training. Now, it is possible today uh, to be better grounded in real physics because of online resources like classes from Stanford and from MIT. But in the early 90s, and <laughs> you needed to be in a, a, a nerd town, a school town like, like Boston or something um, to, to really get a, a decent level of training. Now, what I did was I took my experimental approach for uh, molecular biology, where you do several experiments in a day and you just worry about setting up a good experiment. Um, and I actually applied that to theoretical physics. But it was clear I needed some tools. And so I bought a Mac Plus. Actually, it might even be this Mac Plus. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and I crammed this thing with, with, uh, with 10 megs of RAM, which in the day was a lot, OK? Um, and I got Mathematica 3.0 running on it. And um, it was. It, 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 that actually cost quite a bit of money at the time, uh, given that I wasn't rich then, and well, I'm still not, but... <laughs> what it meant, though, was that I was accustomed to testing out the math equations I came up with with an un 
biased jury. Mathematica is a frickin' bitch about details. It caught me thinking I had this great solution, and I totally did not. Now, if even just 5% of fringe physicists were to use Mathematica, I'd really be surprised. Of course, the same might be true of professional physicists who hide behind a wall of the latest jargon of the bleeding edge. You know, Mathematica can, can just tell you that you're wrong. <laughs> and who wants to hear that? <laughs> well, actually, the ultra-conservative fringe wants to hear exactly that. We want to hear about our errors. And now, over the years of my efforts, I have had professional physicists, professors, full professors, uh, critique me not more than half dozen times. And each critique was right. It required months or years of effort on my part <laughs> to actually understand what they were saying and then reformulate my work. I always had to do something different. And I think I've been incredibly fortunate that I actually have found new roads around the blocks they pointed out. So let me give you like a concrete example. I showed these field equations to a full professor at MIT that I claim could unify gravity and electromagnetism. I didn't care about those other forces then. <laughs> I do now. Um, but he said, well, you really need to have a Lagrangian and show, using the Euler Lagrange equations, how that leads to your field equations you've just shown here, and show how there are solutions to those field equations, and then show how those solutions you find are consistent with current tests that are out there. And then don't forget that you must find some kind of experiment or some kind of condition such that your proposal is now distinct and different from what we already have out there. Because if you just reinvented the wheel, uh, we already got a wheel. <laughs> <laughs> so I nodded and I said, oh, that's true, I thank you, and I walked out of his office all depressed because I didn't know what a Lagrangian was. <laughs> yes, it took me a year and a half to understand what a Lagrangian was, or how to use the Euler Lagrange equations, or how to find solutions to that whole sort of thing. I mean, I still have my Xerox copy of Landau and Lifshitz, uh, the classical theory of fields, somewhere in this basement. I, I actually looked for it. I, I couldn't find it. I, my organization has taken a step down the number of times I've had to move around in Boston. Uh, oh, well. So, the most startling thing, though, that I learned was that when I finally got it, that it usually was a pretty simple idea. In this example, a Lagrange density is every way that energy can be traded inside of a box. And by taking different derivatives, you end up, say, getting to the force equations. That's probably derivative with respect to the velocity, if you want to be fancy. Um, you can get to the field equations if you vary the potential. You can get to the stress energy tensor, if you so like. And it's all because you've already got every way energy can be traded inside of a box, and you're just looking at those tr energy trades in different ways. Now, out on the ultra-conservative fringe, I'm actually comforted when I find out something I've done has been done before. <laughs> I really try to avoid making up new words 
because that's like the surest way to make sure that your work stays in isolation forever. Now, it is unfortunate that I've had to use unpopular words, uh, in particular quaternions. Now, for a while, I worked things out with quaternions, you know, on the in, in Mathematica, and where quaternions are just a scalar and a three vector together kind of mashed up with the idea of like complex numbers, the three vector being the, the I, it's like a three I as it were, and then presenting them as tensors because quaternions are tensors. They're just constrained to work exclusively in four dimensions. I found though that avoiding uh, the word tensor, sorry, quaternions, um, is not really panning out um, because the power of a mathematical field, fancy way of saying you can add, subtract, multiply, and divide, you know, what you could do with real numbers back in third grade, um, that's just too important. And in fact, I use that multiplying and dividing to get out to the weak field and the strong field. Symmetries. Do I have any converts? I have no interest in converts. I'm interested in people who carry around baseball bats because I want them to really smash my idea. Uh, oh, I, actually, this isn't a bat. This is actually a, this is a telescope. <laughs> but you know, I think for this group, you know, that 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 actually may be more appropriate. Okay, so um, you know, go ahead, shatter my idea, make my day. <laughs> I actually have one one part-time uh, physics grad student uh, who's working with me. Uh, that statement itself is rather absurd, uh, given that I don't got a job, <laughs> I don't got money, I only got ideas. <laughs> They're beautiful. No, let me not overact too much here. Over dramatize the blog. All right. Um, <laughs> it was actually pressure from him. Um, that is making me try to rebuild uh, quaternion quantum field theory from the uncertainty principle on up. It's an insane mission, uh, but so far it's fun, if you find this kind of thing fun. <laughs> well, I do hope to find a solid technical reason why my unified standard model Lagrangian and field equations and solutions are wrong. And then I can retire some delusions of grandeur I have and go back to a normal hobby. <laughs> so any skeptical assistance will be appreciated. Thank you very much.